everyone. Welcome back and uh, thank you for tuning in to Red Ice Radio. This is an independent investigative radio program with headquarters in uh, Sweden on the Scandinavian Peninsula. That's in Northern Europe, by the way. My name is Henrik Palmgren. I hope you're doing well today. It's uh, nice as always to be able to speak to you wherever you are from. If you are new to the program, know that you can hear three new radio programs per week on RedEyesCreations.com and every other week one of these will be Radio 314. There's just a couple of things I want to mention to newcomers before we get to our guest. We uh, cover you know, a lot of different topics that we find to be important and interesting. Everything might not be to your tastes, but uh, we do attempt to go far and wide in our search for answers and to highlight problems, issues, suppression of free speech, corruption, and conspiracies, and by no means have we covered everything yet. This is an ongoing process, so your patience is appreciated. We want to give our audience a chance to hear from a multitude of different perspectives, agree or not, that's your call. You know, some people seem to think that we are here to simply enforce their current beliefs and, uh, you know, make you comfortable in the sanctioned alternative position and views. Not at all. We are here to challenge those preconceived ideas and discuss things that so many people shy away from, especially when it comes to beliefs, ideologies, religions, cultures, and political agendas. In other words, doing the job that public service was supposed to do in uh, so many European countries anyway, but of course have failed so miserably at. So our hope is that you will learn something new in these programs. If there is a common thread among what might seem to you as contradictory concepts, and that is because we have to put material against itself in the research process to see how the work holds up. But the common message throughout all of this is that we always encourage you to question everything you hear on this program and all other programs you're listening to as well. Think, evaluate, and then re-evaluate. Kevin McDonald, an evolutionary psychologist and a professor at California State University Long Beach, is with us today. He's the author of uh, seven books, I believe, and over a hundred scholarly monographs. His trilogy, The Culture of Critique, is an examination of Judaism as a group evolutionary strategy. Much has been written about this brave and controversial academic and prolific author, but you can't really paint a picture until you've heard from him yourself. Whether you're a friend or foe, I hope that our following program will enlighten you and give you a new perspective. Today our topic is on European identity, biology, race, ethnic competition, immigration, 20th century Jewish intellectual movements and leftist bias in Western academia and media. Later in the program, we talk more about the situation in Ukraine and the treatment of Russia in Western media. And just uh, one more thing here before we begin. As uh, Voltaire once said, to learn who rules over you, simply find out who you are not allowed to criticize. Welcome, Kevin. Thank you so much for being here and uh, talking with us today about your work. Thank you for coming on. Hope you're doing well today. Just fine. Glad to be here. Excellent. Now, you're the author of the three-volume, The uh, Culture of Critique. And uh, I think it was my own uh, passion, really, to, to research the history of the Frankfurt School and the history of uh, political correctness and critical theory that, that led me in uh, the direction towards your work. But uh, your perspective is, is one seldom heard in, in the media. And when it is... Of course, unfortunately, it's one of immediate disqualification, almost ad hominem attacks, all kinds of straw man arguments and everything else. And this is, by the way, the very fact that you're talking about something that goes against the political correctness of our time. Even the alternative media, I think, has difficulty talking about some of the topics that uh, I hope we can get into a little bit here today. Uh, there are a few, but, uh, you know, it's I think it's really important, therefore, also to kind of uh, give some time to this and talk about this. But, you know, Kevin, we, we have a lot of different people on this program. We talk about as many different perspectives as, as possible, really. But I think that you're highlighting something that is very important in, in your work, something that we've been taught is wrong, something that we've been taught not to recognize, something that we've uh, really turned our backs to, especially in the Western world and, and Europe. And I can just talk about my own experience growing up in the political correct uh, dictatorship, really, of, of Sweden. And I know that some people... Uh, who never been there or never lived there will kind of laugh at that, but there is just an unbelievable climate, really, that a few people on the outside can even begin to imagine and uh, and understand. But you know, we've we've tried to churn some of that out in some of our previous series on the Nordic model and uh, Sweden, by the way. But you know, going into this program, then Kevin, I just listed so many angles and different things that we could begin to talk about, really. But I think the best place to start is to 
if we could talk a little bit about biology and and uh, psychology, really, the difference between different people and and races. Again, today we're taught that we're all the same, of course, we all come from Africa and that's it. But I believe that you started looking at the group evolutionary strategy from the point of view of the Old uh, Testament first. Your, your work really harkens way back into prehistory, really, in order to understand uh, different races, different cultures and biology that is hardwired into us. But maybe you can talk a little bit about this tremendous imbalance and chaos that we have in our world today from the perspective of uh, if we look back into history and the and the group evolutionary strategy, Kevin. Yeah, my 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 first inspiration in, in this area was um, basically evolutionary biology. It was a sort of a dogma in evolutionary biology that groups really were not the basis, were not the main unit of selection, of natural selection. And uh, I thought that, well, that might be true with animals, but with humans, humans are able to overcome a lot of the problems that people saw with natural selection with, among animal groups. and. And so I, I decided to, to to just take a group that would really illustrate groupness, you know, the, the importance of groups. And I thought about, you know, I thought I would take Jews because they have been so Im, uh, important historically. It's, it's so well documented and so on. And so I simply started, uh, as you say, I started reading the Old Testament. Uh, I never really read the Old Testament before, and it was really a very much of an eye-opener, because you could see the ethnocentrism there, that, that, that this Jewish God was basically the, the God of their people, and, and uh, God was uh, uh, basically out for the interests of the Jewish people. And if you, if, if Jews, you know, contravene the, the will of God, if they went against the, the, the written law and, and so on, they would be ostracized, horrible things would happen and so on. So that that was, you know, really the the the, the, the first insight because you could see the 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 huge bias against intermarriage. They were very concerned about the Jewish gene pool. You know, when I first read the Old Testament, I wasn't even sure I had anything. You know, that there was anything really to write about. But once I read the Old Testament, you could see this extreme concern about inter, uh, the horror of intermarriage. And, and keeping the, their their gene pool pure, so th that's that's obvious an evolutionary uh, interest, and and so that that was the beginning of, of what my I started to think about there. Definitely. Now, how would you say that that differ then from, let's say, uh, if we look at when the when the ice age is beginning to uh, you know uh, go further up north, and we have migrations of of uh, you know Europeans at that time early in history. What kind of society w was built there in the beginning, would you say, and how does that differ from what you just described? Well, in some of my writings, I've, I've um, developed a contrast between the, these Middle Eastern societies. I don't think Jews are unique. They're very much part of the, the Middle Eastern cultural area. Uh, in, in this, uh, the, the various characteristics of Jewish society reflect that general cultural area. The, uh, very strong concerns about in-groups and out-groups, very collectivist. Uh, European societies, especially northern European societies, tend to be individualistic. We tend not to have really strong in-group, out-group uh, attitudes, whereas Jews have, yeah, that's one of the, the main markers of Judaism, is this sense of the in-group versus the out-group. Uh, really hatred and distrust towards out-groups. Whereas northern Europeans are much more individualistic. If you look at marriage practices, it's much more indi about individual choice. Jewish marriage traditionally was always about family strategizing and so on. There was no emphasis on love. It was all an emphasis on um, uh, status and property and so on. Uh, whereas Western marriage from a very early age really has been mainly about uh, personal attraction and so on. So it, it's very deep. It, it goes, uh, in, in the West you've, you've got the principle of one man, one woman. You know, the basic institution of monogamy. Middle Eastern cultures have always been about concubinage, polygyny, and so on. Uh, Jews have actually practiced those things uh, in, in various societies when they have not been in the, in the Western cultural sphere, they, they, where they have modified to a substantial extent. But you can see the basic of it. If you look at the Old Testament, all the all the patriarchs were had multiple wives. Uh, Solomon, all, all, you know, various Jewish kings. It was part of that. Middle Eastern cultural milieu, and uh, again, very strong contrast. In some of my writings, I, I've got like ten different big differences. Uh, if you look at the preface to my book, The Culture of Critique, which is online, 
you just go to my website, kevinmcdonald.net, you can find the preface to the culture of critique. And I describe that, that those, those contrasts in detail. They're very important because I, th I think we Westerners are much less collectivist. We, we have much more of a, it's hard to get us uh, to have a cohesive group sense. It, it is possible. We, we have some of the same mechanisms, but they're just not as, as intense as, as Jewish groups have. Now, it's in, in one way, that seems a little bit maybe like a contradiction, as, as, at least if we look way back into history, when there seems to be an idea that we have to get together in order to survive. I think that would be even more true, perhaps, under very, very cold conditions, let's say. And I wonder if that has laid a little bit of the groundwork, at least in the northern uh, European societies. What do you think about that? Well, I, th I think I think that European groups, and especially northern European groups, did have to form groups. But these groups were, were based on reputation uh, rather than kinship. If you look at the Middle East, it's all about kinship. If you look at the old, in fact, the Old Testament was, was where I really got uh, the insight on that. But if you look at European groups, they're much less based on kinship. They're open to anybody who uh, basically adopt the, the standards and practices of the group. You said, so there's a very strong emphasis on personal honesty and reputation. Uh, if you can imagine the Ice Ages, if, if you had a group and you were trying to get, you know, if, if other people wanted to join the group, what, what happened, it looks like, was that people were selected on the basis of their reputation. How honest were they? How trustworthy? They were not based. The, the selection process was not based on kinship. Kinship had a, was de-emphasized in those groups. Close family relationships, yes, you know, kinship was important there, but not in the wider group anywhere near to the extent that you see <clears throat> in other societies. So other societies dominated by clans that, that, that are very resistant to change. In Europe, well, whatever clan structure there was melted away pretty quickly, uh, you know, even even by the Middle Ages. Uh, whereas in the Middle East, it's still you still can't get rid of that. I mean, the, we had this huge long war in Iraq, and at the end of that war, the the social structure of Iraq, we had first cousin marriages and uh, strong kinship clans and so on. Those are still there, and in the West, we we've gotten beyond that for a, a long time ago. And it's because we're just more individualistic. Uh, our groups are much more based on reputation, honesty, and so on as the criteria. If, if you had a, if you were in the ice age and you had a situation where other uh, people's, uh, you know, where people were in your group, the most important thing uh, apparently was to make sure that they were not cheaters. And so the people like that would be ostracized; they'd be expelled from the group. But it was not based on strong kinship relationships. Right. Uh, I want to put that in the context of our you know, modern age, obviously a little bit later with multiculturalism and everything and what has happened there. But uh, is there any biological trait then in, uh, well, in any group really, I guess, that is about conquering other groups in order to survive? I'm thinking of what uh, we've heard about, you know, homo sapiens and the treatment of Neanderthals, for example, if that's true, that we practically drove them to extinction and that was it, right? Well, we probably did. I, I think there was some some inter intermating though between the between those groups. Uh, some recent evidence, uh, and, and that could be part of, of the European gene pool. Yeah, but yes, I think I think uh, th that you know when you look at at the history, and that's one of the things that terrifies me. If you look at human history, you, you know there have been the, all this ethnic conflict, all this genocide, and we are now entering into a future where, where European countries. United States and so on, which have traditionally had big, huge European majorities, are now we're entering this age of multiculturalism. We're admitting all these people, and we're acting as if the, the human history of ethnic conflict is irrelevant, and it's not. You know, we we are entering a very dangerous period, where Europeans are going to be minorities in societies that they have dominated for hundreds, in case of Sweden, for thousands of years. Yeah. In every European country, there's a timetable about when the the indigenous population is going to become a minority. No sane person, uh, a Swedish person, would want that. When they become a minority, you know, then they are going to be uh, at the at the uh, they, they they can be much more easily victimized by these groups. Ethnic conflict doesn't go away. You know, when when we like I was talking about doing the American incursion in uh, the war in Iraq. Ten years later, we haven't changed the social structure of these people. 
they are still as committed to this in-group, out-group, clan-type society and so on as they ever were. And these, these groups being admitted into Europe now, these Muslim groups, they're not going to change. They're not going to become Swedes. Uh, there's, there's just simply no possibility of that. And it's going to set up conflict down the line. The conflict's already there, but it's going to be incredibly much worse down the line. Well, I think that we saw a, 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 an inkling towards this when we had those uh, riots in the suburbs of uh, Stockholm last year uh, in, in the right. end, you know, end of summer, autumn right there. And I attribute a lot of that, Kevin, to the very basis, basic idea as well that the, it's been like a pressure cooker because the media is not covering anything that has to do with the reality on the ground. They're, they're trying to portray an image of what's going on. In some cases, it's so skewed uh, that I, I think people go cuckoo when they look at the regular media and try to figure out how that plays in together. And it is what you mentioned before. It's something that we haven't recognized, that there is something incredibly new happening on, on the European continent. And for us to think, just as you said, to just leave behind thousands of years of of uh, you know culture and, and tradition and doing things in a certain way for this kind of newly adopted Frankfurt School, uh, you know, ideology really is just amazing. And, and we there's something that is there's a disconnect there. And people have to begin to recognize that we can't just change this overnight. Right. It's, it's just incredible. And I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the media that throughout the West, the, the mainstream, the, 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 the most important, uh, the po- most important media are entirely on board with this shift towards massive non non-European immigration towards multiculturalism and so on. They're the first to jump on anybody who criticizes that as a racist, as an evil person. Uh, and and that, that, that's a big part of it, that, that uh, you know, we who are opposed to this are on the outside at this point. We have no power. We're looking in, we're watching this disaster unfold. We're watching people who mention this or, or criticize it. We're, we're seeing them being ostracized. We're seeing them being labeled as anti-Semites or racists and all of that. And, and it, it's horrifying to see it because we, from, from our point of view, and we are right about this, this is just leading us down the road to greater conflict, to incredible uh, sort of social unease. And, and uh, you know, uh, it, it's going to – we certainly haven't seen the, the worst of it yet. You talk about those riots in Sweden. There have been riots in France. There have been riots in many countries that I'm subjected to this kind of thing. Well, that's just the tip of the iceberg. It's going to be much worse in the future when whites are a, a smaller percentage of the population, when they start losing political power to a greater extent. It's just, uh, this is just the beginning. Well, I think that, you know, in, in the point of view, from the point of view of Sweden, again, uh, Swedish media is government subsidized and that really creates a lot of, uh, you know, problems and, and the uh, one-sidedness of the, of the uh, perspective. I think there was one, uh, lady and immigrant from Ethiopia, I believe as well, that actually decided to go back to, to Ethiopia. Uh, I might have that wrong, and I'm, I'm sorry if that's the case. It might have been another country. But she talked about the media environment in, in Sweden, and she mentioned that it was so dangerous for the fact that people were not allowed to discuss these questions in the media. And her angle, and I agree with that fundamentally, that it's going to lead to a pressure cooker scenario. And, and this is going to cause even worse. It's going to cause that people get more, you know, extreme, if you will, that they're going to get more, uh, you know, angry and upset about this because no one is actually talking about their perspective and whatnot. So it's a tremendous imbalance here. And sometimes I even wonder, Kevin, if is if that actually is pl- part of the plan, if you know what I mean, to actually create that type of scenario. I don't know if I'm going too far there, but what do you think about that? Well, I, th- I think that is uh, a part of it. Uh, the, 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 the mainstream media and other, you know, um, institutions at the top of the society, and I mean by that the corporate world now and the academic world, uh, are all on page about this. And, and they, uh, they are ostracizing anybody who's not on page. You can very easily lose your job. Uh, so it's really a reign of terror. And you, you're talking about Sweden as a sort of dictatorship. Well, it is in that sense. And America is too, and England and France and all these countries. Where if you get out of line, these forces are going to come down on you very strong. The power is there. And they, they uh, are many, many examples in the United States. I'm sure there are examples in Sweden where people have lost their jobs and lost their livelihoods because they've simply expressed their opinions about these things. It's just uh, an amazing uh, reign of terror here. 
definitely we'll get into the Frankfurt School in a little bit, but uh, I just want to mention as well that there's certainly other uh, European scenarios, of course, that have bloomed up in the last few years. And I think that it's turned even more bizarre, really, when we had back in 2010 those those uh, uh, statements by the, the major leaders of Europe. And they mentioned that basically multiculturalism was a failed experiment. I'm referring to, uh, you know, Angela Merkel, Nicolas Sarkozy right. and David Cameron. And just yeah. that very idea that they dropped that ball, but never really kind of picked it up from there. It was almost like, I don't know, it's very strange to me that they did that. And and consequently, though, this is not really problems that have continued to be addressed. Why is that, do you think? Huh, it's funny. Yeah, Those are amazing quotes. And But I think the reaction was, we have to do more to make it work. You know, in right. other words, uh, they, they didn't say, well, we should maybe stop this and maybe try to repatriate some of these immigrants and... And, uh, you know, really try to, you know, reinforce the sense of a homogeneous um, Swedish culture, German culture, or English culture or something. No, the response, I mean, they, this, David Cameron, so-called conservative, they have cut down immigration a little bit, but basically there's no change. And now the conservative party is losing a lot of voters to, to the, uh, the uh, UKIP party. And actually, Labor's losing a lot of voters, too, because... It's the, it's, the, it's the working class in England and, and, th- and really throughout Europe, throughout the Western world that has most really borne the brunt of this in terms of really practical on the ground consequences at this point. These are the people that have lost their jobs, uh, they are they're inundated, they're, they're, the uh, um, wages have gone down because of all this immigration and everything. Uh, these people are very angry and they're looking for a place to vote. Uh, and you know. Th- the, uh, the Conservative Party is certainly not going to appeal to them because they, they're not really any different from Labour, just a little bit less so. Uh, so, And I'm sure that's true in, in Sweden where you don't have political choices really anymore. No, exactly. And it doesn't really matter where you look in the spectrum. It's it's very much the same. And it's also this kind of consensus that it's the problem is really with Sweden and Swedes. It's really, it's really that... Uh, you know, old homogenous kind of society that's really to blame for all of this. We're not, you know, hip and kind of in with the with the times kind of things. With this is a transformation that has to occur from the if, well, it's from the inside now then, but really by elements from the outside. That this it basically is something wrong with that, which is in itself, of course, a, a ridiculous point. But uh, what do you think is the plan there then? Because we have statements, for example, by. Uh, we've we've referred to this before. We we had a conversation a couple of years ago or now with with four different. Uh, researchers and authors on on Zionism and uh, multiculturalism. And we play that clip by uh, Barbara Spector where she talks about the uh, the necessity, basically, to make Europe multicultural. And this was, again, specifically from the point of view of Sweden, where, where she mentioned that. And I don't know how she can make this statement because she said, we, the Jews, are going to be responsible for making you know Sweden and Europe multicultural, and therefore we'll, we'll be resented for that. I'm paraphrasing here, but something like that. Now... One of my questions were there, what, what kind of meeting has she been to that she, that she can speak for all the Jews of how the decisions are going to make in terms of Europe? Isn't that kind of a, a silly statement, really? What do you make of it? It's, yeah, Barbara Spector is just an incredible example. I've, I've put that video on the Axel Observer a, a few times. Uh, yeah, she's, she, you know, it's, it's so hypocritical because uh, she would never think of that, uh, that that should be a good policy for Israel. She, she would have, as, as the vast majority of Jews do, would have the idea that Israel should be a Jewish state, meaning that they, they can restrict immigration. In fact, Israel is expelling immigrants from Africa who uh, who just walked over the border, basically. They, now they have a big fence there. They're expelling them. And, you know, whereas in, in, in the diaspora, these, these, these mainstream Jewish groups, and Barbara, uh, Barbara Speck, uh, she's certainly part of that, they are entirely in favor of multicultural, entirely in favor of immigration. So it just depends on where they are. They don't have any universal principles about uh, immigration and multiculturalism. It depends on whether it's good for them, where they are. And it's just outrageous for her to say that Europe needs to become multicultural. Nobody needs to become multicultural. Does China need to become multicultural? Korea? No. It's only the white co- countries, only the European countries. And European-derived countries like the United States and Australia, these are the ones that have to become multiculturalism in this view. They have to give up their their sense of homogeneity, give up the sense of this European identity. So this is an assault on our people and our culture. It's just a naked assault. And we have to see it for what it is. It's a power play. 
And it, it has no basis in logic, in history, in psychology, or anything else. This is just a, an assault, uh, really, on our people and culture. Why is that then, do you think? What, what is the, the reasoning, whether it's logical or not? What's the reach, reasoning behind this from the cultural elite that uh, Europe needs to change in this way? Yeah, well, I, I think um, you mentioned the Frankfurt School. That was one of the big origins of it. Uh, the Frankfurt School developed the idea that ethnocentrism was a, a psychopathology, you know, that there was something wrong with people uh, who were ethnocentric, that they, they tried to show that they had disturbed family relationships and all that. And it was completely nonsense. Uh, it was based on just fabricated science. Uh, but it became a very important book. Uh, it, it was in that, that sort of point of view was then picked up by Jewish activist organizations like the Anti-Defamation League and other Jewish organizations uh, beginning in the 1950s, really. And you started to, they started to have um, you know, propaganda be given to, to, to say, teachers in educational uh, settings of various kinds. And um, they, these, these organizations simply got more and more powerful. They managed to, to uh, change the immigration law in the United States in 1965. So that, that race was not a criterion. Prior to that, the United States was biased towards, towards uh, immigrants from Western Europe. That was then changed. All this was a result of Jewish activism. That's not the only thing. I don't want to overestimate the contribution of Jews. I, you know, Jews, these Jewish activist organizations were, in fact, how these immigration got, uh, laws got changed. But now you see a huge complicity with the, the big uh, corporations. They want cheap labor. They are committed to uh, the, you know this idea of the sort of globalization, free movement of market of peoples. A free movement of goods and so on. So it, it, these are entwined now together, and it's a hugely powerful force. So it's, it's not just the Jewish activist organizations, although they are very powerful, and they began these trends because Europe was not that way, the United States was not that way until these things started being changed by by Jewish activist groups. But the, the, there's a huge complicity now of these big corporations, big economic power. They want immigration. They want to lower wages. They uh, have no sense of national economic interest. And so you, you, you have these free trade uh, laws in the United States. We have huge trade deficits. Uh, the American economic policy is simply not being based on the needs and desires of Americans. And, and it's been the case for a long time. Well, it, it is what it is in terms of uh, statistic uh, statistics. No, no matter what someone calls you for it for pointing out, it's just what it is. Otherwise, it's you know ridiculous if you cannot look at statistics anymore and say what it is. But in your view, then this uh, this has a historical, uh, I guess, a historical and uh, you know kind of root in how Europe has been viewed from from the Jewish perspective and and Middle East maybe overall as well in terms of. What happened there? I mean, if we if, again, if we go back into history, we can examine all the expulsions, all the pogroms, and all the things that have occurred in, throughout European history, and we can talk about that from a number of different perspectives. But maybe you can just outline that that first of all. That is, do you think then that Europe uh, has been seen as a, as an enemy? The Western world is, is is an enemy. Is that correct? That that is quite correct. That's a basic thing I keep talking about 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 Jews as a hostile elite. Jews are an elite, and, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, Jews have various qualities, including intelligence, but also very strong ethnic networking, where they, they sort of naturally then, given those qualities, they rise to the top of the society. That in itself is it would not be a problem, except that they have this hostility towards the people and culture of the West. From their point of view, the West uh, began with the persecutions of Jews by the Catholic Church in the fourth century, and it ended in the Holocaust. And in between, you had medieval expulsions, and you had the Tsarist uh, pogroms, and uh, you had uh, all these other things. And, and so that is their perception of Western culture. And uh, in, in that view, Jewish behavior has always been completely irrelevant to any outbreak of, of anti-Jewish hostility. So, uh, and, and that's a huge academic industry now. We're examining that a lot on the Occidental Quarterly and the Occidental Observer uh, websites. There's some very good writing on that, especially by this guy, Andrew Joyce. He's, he's an excellent historian and, and uh, documenting uh, how Jews have often exaggerated their losses, like in the pogroms in the 19th century in Russia. Um, 
but the, the point is that, that there's this hostility because of how they perceive Western culture through their own eyes. You know, we, we tend to look at back in the past, we think of cathedrals and we think of the successes of Europe, the science, the technology, and the art and the music and all these, these accomplishments. But when they see it, they see it just as various faces of evil, you know, that, they, that, that, that the West is fundamentally evil because it's been hostile towards Jews at various times and places. And that's, that motivates them. Uh, this hostility towards the people and culture of the West um, has huge repercussions. Again, it wouldn't matter if Jews were not an elite. If, if Jews were, say, like, like uh, gypsies or something like that, uh, where, where, they are, where they don't become educated, they remain on the outside, they, you know, petty you know, crime and so on, that was nothing. But the problem is that Jews are intelligent. They are they ethnic. They they work with each other very well. Huge ethnocentrism, and and they become an elite. And and when they become an elite, then they are hostile to the people and culture of the West. Uh, and and again, th their their power though is not to be discussed. I think you mentioned that right at the very beginning. Uh, it, it's something that uh, can't be discussed. So even if you make a a very rational, factually based discussion, say, of Jewish influence in Hollywood, that would be seen as anti-Semitic. You, know, right. you, you can't discuss that. It's off limits. And, and so unlike other groups, the power of Jewish, uh, of this Jewish hostile elite is simply can't be discussed. And so we don't have very many good studies of it. People are terrified. They don't want to go there. And anybody who does, like like myself, we get pilloried, we get uh, sure. labeled in semi, we get yeah. thrown. Th they try to get you to, they, they try to force you to lose your job, and uh, they they do everything they can to destroy you. So that's that's how it works. Well, I think it's important to discuss these things and free speech and the fact that we have to have ability to look at history and talk about statistics and data and whatever it points to, so be it, that be the case. Let's look at it, let's examine it, let's get it out in the open instead of putting the lid on, because I believe that that is going to cause far more problematic uh, creation of, of extremist groups, if you will, than anything else for that matter. But nonetheless, let, let's return to, to a few couple of things that you talked about here and look at that from a few different perspectives, perhaps. Um, I think it was in the Wired magazine uh, last year sometime, uh, Samuel uh, Arabesman, uh, Ar Arabesman, I mispronounced his last name there, he wrote about basically the uh, 700 years of uh, European Jewish, uh, you know, persecutions and expulsions. And they had actually um, picked up what they call long data. I think it was from 1,363 different city uh, levels or cities that had been examined. And I think there was, um, or maybe it was actually, let me do those numbers again. It was 936 different European cities that had been looked at between the years 1100 and 1800. And there had been... 1,366 level city persecutions of Jews at that time. So how do we explain that? What, what, what is that? Is this a, uh, how do, is this just a behavior from a, uh, you know, psychotic European population that have some kind of spasmic reaction that is completely out of the blue whatsoever? Or is there any reasoning be, be behind why this occurred in history? Well, I, th I think um, the, 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 perspective of Jewish intellectuals has been that, yes, that it's simply a, a matter of some kind of pathology within the European culture. Christianity, for example, they, you know, the idea that Jews killed Christ, that uh, then, you know, that a, lot, a lot of them had thought that that was the fundamental thing. Um, my own point of view, and, and the other thing that, that comes out of that is uh, Jewish activists, uh, when they, they are happy to cite that kind of thing, but it's never, uh, you know, it's never taken to imply that there was anything that Jews did that contributed to this. It's completely one-sided. Uh, there's a recent book by, that uh, just was reviewed in, in the uh, New York Review of Books by M Michael Walzer. And the whole idea is that the Western attitudes about Jews have always been sort of imaginary, that they've been completely un unrelated to anything real. Well, it's just false. And again, I mentioned Andrew Joyce. Uh, if you look at his writings on Oxford Observer, and if you look at my book, the, the Separation is Discontents. My my second book on on, on Jews was called Separation is Discontents, and it's about it, historical anti-Semitism. And the view there is that these outbreaks of anti-Semitism has always been about real conflicts of interest. 
they, they, they may not be, you know, entirely reasonable from the standpoint of Europeans, but Jewish behavior always factored into it. The fact is, I mean, just one, one aspect of this, Jewish economic behavior has always seen non-Jews as exploitable, uh, as exploitable outgroup. So they, they have not had the same kind of business ethics or any kind of ethics when they, when they come, when they deal with outgroups like Europeans historically. Uh, versus that their own within their own group, a huge difference. One of the one of the things that the big differences between Europeans and and Jews is a sense of ethics. Europeans have developed a sort of universalist ethical systems like Kant's moral imperative, uh, and the idea is that ethical uh, principles are true of all times and places and that sort of thing. Jews never had that idea. It was all they have very different moral standards within the group and outside the group. And that one was written down. Slavery, for example. I mean, they've been very happy to have slaves outside the group, and, and to, to treat them very different from 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 Jews who were either slaves or not slaves within the group. So it's just a sort of in-group, out-group psychology, where there's a, a sort of normative hostility towards the surrounding peoples, and that's what we see over and over and over again. I mean, it's, it's sort of amazing to think that, and, and, and by the way, anti-Semitism has not been restricted to Western societies by any means. There's a lot sure. of it. Yeah. You, you could go through the various Muslim societies in various times and places, huge anti-Jewish antipathy. So this is not restricted to Western societies. Uh, it's been going on for a very, very long time. And to say that Jewish behavior is completely irrelevant is just to engage in a fantasy. It's propaganda and it's ideology. And it, 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 and it's just part of the vilification of Europe, you know, uh, that European culture is somehow uniquely evil. Slavery is another good example in America. People who uh, use slavery as a weapon against white America, but people don't talk about the fact that when, that in the 19th century, slavery existed everywhere else in the world. It was only, it was only in America and in England and so on. Western European countries that abolished slavery, and they did so for moral reasons. No other culture has done that. There's a huge body of law in, in Jewish religious law about slavery, because Jews have been slave traders in many times and places, from the ancient world through the, the uh, Spanish, Portuguese uh, trade with the New World into, into America. But there was never any moral outrage at slavery. I, I mean, you can read just reams of Jewish religious law about the treatment of slaves in various ways. So, you know, the, what, what happened was that Europeans decided it was morally unacceptable to do that. And, and they fought a civil war with 600,000 men died in the civil war in America. To, the, the main motive was to free the slaves. And, and you know, that's an astonishing thing. Uh, and I, I, you know, I don't think anybody should be proud of slavery. But we have to understand that this is used as a weapon against us when Europeans were the only people to to free the slaves and, and to abolish slavery for moral reasons. And this was at the 19th century. Slavery existed everywhere. It was very, very unusual to find a society. It was it was all over Africa, the Arab world, China, yep. India, everywhere. Yep. Europe was the only place that abolished it. And yet we are the ones that are are seen as the absolute evil. It's absurd. Well, I mean, there's so much skewed information here that it's just incredible. I mean, again, it was just, just as you say, if we look back into history, uh, there are so many different cultures and, and uh, nations that have had slavery to a certain extent. I was reading about the Vikings that had their uh, Slavs, I think, a lot of slaves during that time. It's. I think we make a huge mistake if we are going to judge the past and look at history with our current moral lens, because that is just not going to work. We, we have to, it was just what they did at the time. Today we can judge that, cer certainly that's, that's really bad, but in no means, just as you say, was it singled out by one group against another. Exactly, and, and the problem is it's used as a weapon against us. You know, no other uh, culture is made to feel bad about this. Did, have you ever heard about Arabs feeling guilty about slavery? The, the, the no. thousands years of their engagement in the slave trade. They, they had all these Arab traders going down to Africa. They enslaved Africans. But nobody ever talks about that. The only people that are, are vilified for this are, are white people. And, and it's, just, it's just it's part of the culture of Western dispossession, where it's so hard for, 
for for Europeans to feel a sense of confidence and and pride in in the past and have a sense of their own culture and and really feel proud about it, you know, because uh, and again these the Jewish intellectual movements, the one thing in common, they have made moral critiques of Western culture, and and I think I think I think the West, the, this tendency towards universalism and this sense of uh, moral universalism is very important. And as I was saying, I think Western groups are much more based on reputation. And so if you are shamed in the group, if you are seen to be evil, uh, it is very difficult for us Westerners to deal with. The hardest thing that I ever had to do in my whole life was deal with this hostility that I had uh, at my university. You know, where right. you're getting, you know, getting two dozen emails every day for quite a long period of time. They're just saying how evil you are. Right. And I have to go to work every day. That's not easy to do. No. You know, and it's it's about shame and guilt, and, and because you've let down the group, you you have not you've not subscribed to the in group's morality. In the Ice Ages, people like that were expelled, and that, and that was typical in European groups, I'm sure, uh, and elsewhere. But the point is, we we uh, the sense of guilt and shame is what we have to overcome. This is just imposed on us for no good reason. We're the most, you know, again, who, what, what are the people, who are the people that abolish slavery for moral reasons? Yep. I, I've got a big paper on that, uh, that um, in the actual quarterly. And this is a very important thing because, uh, especially in the American context, slavery is constantly being brought up. Recently, the Academy Awards, the, the movie that won the picture, the, the award for best, uh, best picture, the Oscar for best picture was this movie 12 Years a Slave, and it's a horrific examination, brutality directed against Africans in America. And that's what it's about. And, and so people go to that, oh, that's what America's all about. You yeah, know? yeah. It's horrible. So you stand up and oppose immigration, you know, because you're a white person, you're evil. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, certainly I, I know this from the perspective of uh, what what happened in Sweden as well, the, the anti nationalism there and even how our own cultural you know our norse mythology of you know runes the whole cultural heritage that we have there has been very effectively and cleverly associated with uh you know racism and neo-nazis and everything else long 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 way back even before we entered into the european union really where our cultural uh ground you know where fundament was being you know grind down to that extent but let, let me just ask you this then so on the flip side here we have all of these things that you mentioned with the with the culmination then of, of Nazi Germany, let's say. And so the reasoning here from one of these perspectives is that to any cost, this needs to be prevented from happening again. And if that means to destroy European culture and heritage, they argue, so be it then. And so from your perspective, is that where we are today? Or how would you explain that from another perspective? Well, I think that that's, that's quite right. I think that, that the people who... The, these intellectuals um, would would love to see the destruction of European culture. That's what this is really all about. Multiculturalism is basically saying other cultures are just as good as you. Allow them into your country. Let them do what they do. Uh, European culture has no special status, and, and you should just step aside when they become a majority. You know that's it. Uh, you know they, they, there's no there's no uh, special um, status for, for European culture. You talk about the culture of Sweden. It's true in every European country where the, 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 the sort of traditional national culture, I've done a lot of, we've posted a lot of articles on England, and, and that's just really common in England. Yeah. The, the British past is colonialism, racism, slavery. That's all it is. And and it's uniquely evil, and it has to be uh, overturned and completely rejected. And you just have to admit all these millions and millions of non-British people and let them hold on to their cultures and traditions. No sense of being British. And, uh, you know, that's, that's what the future is going to be. It's just this, the dispossession of Europe. That's what this is about. Let's talk a little bit more about the Frankfurt School, the origins, and some of the other things that's kind of be behind that. There's, as you said before, there's a lot of psychology behind this. It's about the sexualization of culture, for example. We have psychoanalysis coming, playing into it. We have uh, then people like, you know, Eric Fromm, uh, George Lukács, uh, Theodore Adorno, Max Hor Horkheimer, uh, of course, Mark Husey, that kind of uh, turned the Frankfurt School around a little bit as well. But one of the points here is very, really important that is critical theory, that it's basically about criticizing everything 
that has to do with the Western world. If, if it's about the erosion of the Western culture and the Western world, it's the correct thing. If it's the promotion of it, it's the wrong thing. And this is what's really have been released out into all the major and smaller universities uh, around the world, really, I would say, but then particularly in, in the Western world, correct? That's right. And, and it's particularly important to pay attention to what you said at the end there. It's not just this theory was so wonderful. It was it was based on a lot of you know fictitious science. It was basically a fraud. But what, what is important is that it was picked up at these major universities, picked up in the media. It was promoted. Uh, and we see that over and over again. In my book, The Culture of Critique, the theme of it is that you have these huge intellectual movements. They stick together. They cite each other. They, 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 they sort of um, they, they go behind someone like Freud or Horkheimer or Adorno and, and raise them up to these world historical figures. Um, and one, one of the, I was just today I was reading this article, uh, it actually appeared on Occidental Observer some time ago, about Spinoza. And Spinoza was sort of like, he was a, sort of a philosopher. I, I was a philosophy graduate student uh, a long time ago, and I read Spinoza. I not very impressed by him. I didn't, you know. But all of a sudden you realize that Spinoza is being advanced as the, the most important intellectual of the Enlightenment. And, and it's entirely a Jewish movement that all these different uh, Jewish uh, intellectual professors got together and basically they promoted him to the point where people like Kant and Descartes and uh, you know, Leibniz and all the uh, other intellectuals, Voltaire, are second rate compared to Spinoza. So Spinoza becomes the most uh, European intellectual, the, the, the person who gave us the modern world. It's absurd. It's not based on any facts at all, but they produce this consensus, and the consensus is is among these professors at elite universities, elite university presses. They have access to to uh, the the uh, prominent media, you know, the New York Times, New York Times Book Review, and so on. This is how it's done, and and it's done over and over again. So the Frankfurt School was another example of that. The theory itself was ridiculous. The, the, the idea that ethnocentrism was a sign of psychopathology. Right. If that was true, every, every Jew would be a completely psychopathic, you know, and, and because ethnocentrism is fundamental to, 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 uh, to the, uh, the whole, whole Jewish uh, uh, existence. It, it's what, oh, I forget his name now, but uh, identity politics, right? That's part of it as well. There is a uh, you define your own identity by what has happened to you, both from a point of view of, of, of politics, but it's something that's really, really important to, uh, well, if we look at it from that point of view in terms of, uh, you know, the persecution of the Jews, for example, is an essential component to that actually distinguish the, the culture in a certain degree, right? Yeah, that, that becomes the distinction, that, that becomes the sort of defining feature of the culture. Uh, and that's why you know, Western culture has to be fundamentally destroyed, you know, that, that there's nothing good about it, uh, that it, it is the culture of the Holocaust. It's the culture of slavery that, and colonialism. That, that's what it's about. And so um, that, that is the uh, people go to college now, and that's the message they get over and over and over again. It's like a drumbeat in their humanities courses, courses in the social science. That's that's how they, they they come out of the university as just zombies uh, who hate themselves if they're white, you know. And it's it's very sad and pathetic to see it. But it, you know, it's it's worse than that, of course, because it's the prelude to the complete dispossession of our people and our culture. Well, I want to talk more about that particular uh, aspect and 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 where you see this going in the future. Why you know there, there's so much more, of course, to the components of why this is occurring, but also uh, you know from the perspective of um, why this is so, uh, you know, awful, because it's just a repeating uh, aspect, really, to what we've seen in the history. And it's this kind of idea of one-way tolerance, is get, again, it's, it's, it's tolerance for every other culture and the, uh, you know, the uh, adherence to it or the glorification of it or the, you know, the beauty that you can see in all the multitudes of differences between human races and cultures on this planet. But uh, the white one is the one that's really bad, right? We don't want to go there. We don't. Wanna, we can't talk about that. I can't even mention it I, because I oh, I feel like a racist even saying that. So it's just that ridiculousness of of, of that particular argument. So that's an important point, uh, uh, Kevin, that I want to return to Hill a little bit later. But there's another aspect to this, then, Kevin, that has to do with the creation of a uh, 
Well, really a rootless human being, because I think that that has to do with the creation of of a of one basically that is that is more easily controlled. I've again, I have to go back to my own experience and what I've seen in Sweden and happened there. How our uh, politicians have turned against our own culture, basically in a in a, a number of of ways of of resentments for it that we basically it doesn't uh, it doesn't comprise of anything. It's not not really anything good there. It's all just about you know meatballs and midsummer poles and that's it. You know, kind of neglecting just thousands of years of of rich uh, cultural history with all the wonderful things from the rune alphabet to uh, just all the, the stone and megalithic sites that we have and just everything else all the way up to the viking age and through that but uh, what can you say about the creation of a rootless human being is this has this been a, a component within the frankfurt school that is essential to be able to control uh, people to kind of disconnect them from history so that you can mold them from from a fresh start if you know what i mean i think so i i think it was always directed though at europeans it certainly was not directed at jews jews Jewish identity uh, of the Frankfurt School uh, principles uh, remain very strong, um, but yes, I think that is that is the big thrust here. I mean, if you look at the European Union, they want complete freedom of movement of people and cultures. All that that means is that Sweden, anybody who lives in Italy can come to Sweden, and so on. You're going to lose a sense of Swedish culture, Swedish history, and then of course you have all these Muslims and the Black Africans and everything else. Uh, there's not going to be a, a sense of Sweden anymore. And it's going to be gradual. You still have it to some extent now, I suppose, but it's vilified. Uh, but, you know, what it's going to be like 50 years from now, 100 years from now? Uh, is it going to exist at all? Uh, or is it just going to be in a few museums that nobody goes to anymore? Uh, it, it's, uh, it's very frightening to, to see it that way. I, I think that is the thrust, that free movement of people's the obliteration of traditional cultures, that's really what the EU is all about, and it's very powerful now. Um, and of course, that's what's going on in the United States. The United States and other, all, just all Western countries, is the, uh, the sort of decline of any traditional sense of American culture. When I was growing up, you know, America was 90% white. Uh, it had a sense of, you know, white Anglo-Saxon culture as being sort of our culture, you know. And, even though I wasn't really Anglo-Saxon, I identified with it and, and believed in it. But now it's it's just it's completely gone, uh, and it's not. It certainly has no sort of sense of legitimacy anymore. So it's it's a huge sea change that we've gone through in a very short period of time. I think a lot of people thought that history had sort of come to an end, you know, but it it, it really hasn't. It's, we've gone through the biggest changes in our culture that really they've ever gone through it. And, and it's just going to get more and more dramatic as time goes on. Yeah. I mean, there's people who have talked about this from the perspective of a clash of civilizations, that it's been a kind of a, a conspiracy, really, if you, if you want to look at it that way, to actually create these more, almost like a tribal conflicts on the, on the more smaller level. But this is very efficient, of course, to road nations overall, but that the uh, association with you, if you will, the group association just becomes to a certain extent, smaller and smaller and smaller. And we get these like, you know, streets with uh, we, where you have kind of civil war between these kinds of groups. Is, is that where we're heading? Where, where's this going, Kevin? Well, we certainly are. See, we're seeing a lot of that in America where, where they're, they're changing the, 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 uh, the uh, names of streets. Uh, they're taking statues down. Uh, anything that represented the old culture, they're, they're, you know, schools are being renamed from Thomas Jefferson to Cesar Chavez. Uh, Martin Luther King. All all the the past is 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 being obliterated slowly but surely, and so that that's a big part of it. Uh, sort of the, the it's really about the dispossession of of the American majority, and it's continuing apace. I I think that the eradication that you mentioned before has been very successful so far. I, I don't know what your view on Christianity is, Kevin, but. This is, in fact, an invader to to Europe as well. We had thousands of years of being, you know, quote unquote, pagan. You know, what whatever that actually means. You know, the folk religion, basically. But it was a more a, a mythology that had had a natural, organic progression. I think that there were a lot of similarities between the different European cultures. And then later in the game, this very, you know, violent invader came to that overturned Europe. And then in 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 turn for that, we had a European culture that started to invade into other territories as well to spread Christianity that way. Um, what's your view of Christianity as an invader? 
Well, I certainly, uh, you, you're right. I mean, it started in the Roman Empire, uh, um, and it, it, it has a sort of checkered, you know, some pluses and some minuses. And I, I think there have been t times during European history when Christianity really was the, sort of the culture of the West and it was very proud and it was expansive and, and, and all that. Uh, but now the Christian churches have been completely subver subverted. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church uh, has just completely uh, gone over to the culture of the left. Uh, the Protestant churches in America, at least, and I think throughout Europe, have declined to the point of irrelevance. And I, I, I do, you know, I, I am sympathetic to the argument that part of our problem has been Christianity, that there's too much emphasis on otherworldly things, the, the, the meekness and guilt and, and so on. And, and so there, there may be something there. It's not, so, you know, my, my perspective tends to be ethnic. When I, you know, I talk about European traits, I think more in ethnic terms, the mm -hmm. Ice Age, what we were like then. Yeah. Uh, but Christianity is a powerful overlay and, and uh, it, is, it is an important uh, part of our past. And I, um, but, but you know, when it comes to say Protestantism, the rise of Protestantism is extremely important in European history. And, and I think, though, a lot of the Protest, the, the result of Protestantism was to sort of bring back some of the ethnic uh, tendencies that we have. And, and, and some of them are, are you know, uh, this, this, this moral universalism, the, the, the whole movement to end slavery. This is one of my major research projects that I've just been involved in. The whole movement to end slavery really was movement of these Protestant religious sects that really had a strong egalitarian sense. Now, I see the, the European cultural past as basically a hunter-gatherer society, strongly egalitarian, in which in-groups were based, uh, as I was saying before, that in-groups are based more on reputation, not so much on kinship, uh, and that when, when those groups started really rising to the power in beginning in the 17th century or so, uh, really changed European culture uh, in a dramatically egalitarian way, and uh, that's good to a certain extent. It relieves an enormous amount of energy, but at the same time, we can see the, the, the vulnerabilities now. I don't see those all vulnerabilities as fundamentally religious. I see them as fundamentally ethnic. Uh, there are there are own weaknesses that we have, and we have to understand them and then overcome them. We're the only culture that's being dispossessed in this way. You don't see Korean culture. Uh, they don't admit, uh, you know, all these other peoples and cultures and have disdain for traditional European, uh, Korean past. J Japan doesn't do that. India, none of those countries do that. Western cultures are the only ones. We have to understand Western uniqueness. And, we're, you know, I'm really trying to develop uh, some th theories in that direction. They're not simple theories. They're, they're complicated because the, the European past is extraordinarily complex. It's not like a simple story. Sure. Where if you look at a Korean culture, it sort of was there a long time ago, and it sort of stayed that way. Uh, European culture is very dynamic, and I think there's some fundamental changes beginning uh, really with the Protestant revolu uh, revolutions in the 17th, 16th century. Th those were the things that really changed the way we were. Until then, we had these aristocratic cultures. They're very hierarchical, very elitist. You had corporate Catholic culture and so on. That, that, that was a very different culture than, than happened after uh, the Protestant uh, Reformation with the Enlightenment and those sort of things just fundamentally changed uh, European culture. And that's what we have now. We have to understand the weaknesses of that culture. This radical egalitarianism, this moral universalism, this self-flagellating guilt uh, is, is something we have to get, get rid of. So in an environment then where it's viewed that we're all the same, uh, you know, we're, we're basically taught that there aren't any differences biologically or else, else, you know, way. How do we begin to kind of work against that a little bit? I think there was some research out of Russia, by the way, uh, a while back, and we don't even have to get into how mistreated Russia is in the, in the media right now, Western media. But I think you mentioned that there's a, a pathological altruism associated with this notion that we are all the same. Can you explain that a little bit more? Yes, pathological altruism is part of this theory that, that Western peoples are unique, that the sense of, of, uh, of, of altruism to the point of self-abnegation is, is a unique phenomenon in the West. And we, we see this now. You know, there's so many white people 
in, in America, and I'm sure it's true in Sweden, where they're, they're self-flagellating. They, they're, they, they want to adopt babies from Africa. They, they want to uh, uh, work tirelessly for other people. Uh, and they care nothing about themselves, the culture, their, their family, history, and so on. And so you see that as a very common kind of thing. And I, I see it as a, as a really an, el an element of this ethnic aspect of, of, of Europeans. We tend to be, we tend to, we tend to be a, sort of, we have this sense of, uh, of altruism towards other peoples. Again, I'm thinking about the, the, the anti-slavery movement. I have a big article on that. And, and you look at those people very motivated by helping other people, self-abnegation, profound egalitarianism. Swedish culture is very egalitarian. Northern European culture mm -hmm. is oh, very yeah. egalitarian. You don't have a strong hierarchical sense. And then there's a lot of positive things about that. But at the downside is this, this uh, sense of a moral in-group. And once, once you have this ideology that, say, slavery is wrong, and, and you have this, this strong sense of that's part of your, the psychological identity of being part of that group, well, then you know you persecute anybody who does is not on that is not on that wavelength. And we see now so many white people uh, engaging in this uh, this punishment of, of other whites who uh, are are not as altruistic as they are, who, who you know do, do not uh, want to adopt black children, do all these things to to help others who are not European. So it, it it's become really part of our dispossession, this, this strong sense, this pathological altruism, which I think is ingrained in the hunter-gatherer, ice age type mentality that, that evolved in Northern Europe. So what would you say to people who just dismiss you as, ah, you're just, you're just a racist, you're just an anti-Semite and that's it, I'm not going to listen to you, you're obviously all, all wrong. What would you say to a person that has that view about you and what you're talking about, Kevin? <laughs> I'm trying to understand why we are uniquely so anti-racist. So, so, so many of us uh, Europeans are, are so engaged in uh, really cooperating with their own demise. They have no sense of their own uh, uh, peoplehood, their own sense of you know, wanting to uh, advance the interests of their group, as every other group does. So we have to try to understand that. And, and, uh, I know some people talk about in terms of Christian religion, my own group, my own view that I've developed is that it's part of our ethnic past and we have to get beyond it. But just uh, calling us racist is, is just mindless. I mean, we, there are huge data showing that the races are in fact different and they're prone to different levels of intelligence and other things. Uh, and by the way, Northern Europe, uh, the Northern Europeans, uh, the intelligence of Northern Europeans, one of, the, one of the highest intelligence of any group in the world, uh, was, I think, framed and uh, formed by the Ice Ages. The Ice Ages are a very difficult time. You, you had to invent ways of you know, thinking, you think ahead. You know, what, what's it going to be like three months from now when it's cold out and you yep. can't grow food anymore? So Europeans, uh, Northern Europeans especially, have a very strong sense of, of sort of self-control, what we call conscientiousness in, in psychology. You had to, to survive. So, and, and it, sorry it, to interrupt, it, Kevin, but would you say then that it's we're basically down to talking about climate and uh, the the geology, almost if you will, the land itself, whatever that brought, has 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 made us into different uh, races. Is that how you view this, sir? Yes, I, I think that, and this goes back to the 1930s, 1920s. But people like Richard Lynn and J. J. Philippe Rushton, uh, very prominent IQ researchers and IQ theorists. They, they attribute uh, the intelligence of, of especially in, in, the, in the north of Europe, to, to the Ice Ages, to, that, that we had to evolve in very difficult conditions. And, and you had to plan for the future. You had to develop shelters and clothing. You couldn't just, uh, you, you had to plan very carefully. And, and so our intelligence is geared to sort of mastering the, 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 the environment, whereas Jewish intelligence much more geared to dealing with the social environment. Uh, and, uh, but this, this Northern European intelligence, mechanical, in, engineering, that kind of stuff, and you know, that's what's been sort of 
unleashed with with the these changes of the enlightenment and the rise of science and so on the renaissance all these things resulted in the unleashing of those european qualities and uh, really ushered in the modern world it's very interesting it, definitely it's a, it's a necessity to to survive as you say ability to plan ahead and really understand uh you know what what you're faced with uh, otherwise it will be uh, completely uh you won't survive basically and, and and therefore you have a different type of uh, attitude and outlook from those people at that point but right now we're looking at a you know complete erosion of of cultural identity basically and there's as you said a tremendous guilt associated here then with whom you are where you come from etc there's a very powerful force in this and of course the education and the media as we've been detailing and there's certainly more we could talk about that alone but that whole infrastructure is 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 part of that and and within that of course is tremendous uh, double standards and and one way tolerance from the media and and from the schooling system and everything else. How do you suggest that that ones begin to to break open that type of environment to to begin to be able to discuss some of these things and 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 get people to understand and see the other side, the side that you're talking about here to this? Well, I, I think one of the one of the keys that we use and we hit on this over and over again in the Axel Observer and Axel Quarterly is the hypocrisy of so many of these groups. I mean. That we we in America now we have the Israel lobby and, and they're profoundly ethnocentric. The the basic Israel lobby are these Jewish activist organizations, profoundly ethnocentric. You look at Israel; it's a racialist, it's apartheid state. You have walls between the Palestinians and the Israelis. You have ethnic cleansing. All these things, obviously, the result of Jewish ethnocentrism. And then the Jews in in America are are talking as if multiculturalism and and immigration. Uh, and all that are Jewish values. They're not Jewish values, and and uh, so there's a huge hypocrisy. So, and I think that the 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 question of Israel is the most obvious entree to that. Mm -hmm. That that is something that is so obvious, and because Israel is more and more a pariah state now, you have this this boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement, very successfully making in Israel into pariah. You have academic organizations now in America and elsewhere. That are boycotting Israel, uh, so people are gradually understanding that Israel and and these Jewish activist organizations are not what they are claiming to be. They're claiming to be, you know, this incredibly moral. We we love multicultural. We love immigration. They only love it in areas where they are not in the majority. When they get over to Israel, they become supremely ethnocentric, supremely xenophobic restricted to the immigration, uh, apartheid prone, all those things. So I think that is the entree where people can see it most easily. Once you get that, then it's easy to see, you start to see it in other areas like uh, some of these Jewish intellectual movements, the Frankfurt School of Psychoanalysis, Boazian Anthropology, and so on. You start to see how this whole thing works. But I think that's the entree. How about feminism and uh women treatment in well uh, all of middle east really but i'm just i'm thinking back to this one photo it was a kind of a scandal there when uh well allegedly right bin laden was was caught although no <laughs> evidence for that was really presented but nonetheless we, there was a, an an orthodox uh, J jewish paper i believe that actually edited out uh hillary clinton there from the the photo of the situation room when this was announced because uh, i guess they couldn't publish a, a picture of a, of a woman so so how's that for tolerance right there <laughs> right. Yeah, that's one of the big differences. Yeah, we talk about about the difference between the Western societies and Middle Eastern societies. One of the big ones is treatment of women. Women in, in Western societies would be much more prone to individualism, monogamy, and so on, always had a much higher place. Women did not have, they, they, were, not at, 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 uh, they were not equal to men, certainly. But compared to Middle Eastern societies, they had a hugely uh, uh, advanced status. And, and quite a bit of power within marriages, uh, and and so uh, it's it's a very it's a different uh, totally different culture, and uh, that that's a that's another good entree to look at contrast between East and West in the area of sexual relations. Very important to see Western cultures, by any standard, much more conducive to the freedom the status of women. And yet, well, again, one of the big criticisms of Western culture has been the treatment of women. Uh, and there's never many comparison to these other cultures. It's always, uh, you know, the 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 um, you know the 
failures of, of West to be absolutely egalitarian. Well, uh, that that has not been the case, uh, and and the reality is that these these uh, Jewish intellectual movements have made alliances very strongly. Tried to make alliances with women. So you have all these feminists who hate the West, you know, and and they hate the, the, all the traditional culture. It's just another part of this this huge alliance that we see. Homosexuals as well, you know, homosexuals have been recruited into this alliance. I think it's really interesting to see that that point you mentioned there as well that we have. Uh, it seems to be the case in Sweden anyway that we have a lot of women. Uh, more on the left spectrum of politics, feminists who are are very open to to Islam and they reject everything that has to do with the West, which is a wonderful contradiction, of course. But I guess it's I guess the hatred for the the own culture is greater, uh, and, and therefore they align more with what whatever else is out there in the world. I don't know how to explain it, but there you go. There it is. I can't explain it either because uh, the Islam, uh, the the treatment of women, the status of women in Islam is abysmal. When you have a polygynous society, polygyny is really the root of that. Uh, where because because women become concubines, basically, and and they're bought and sold, and that's true in Africa, Islam, throughout the world. That, that, that's one of the, the 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 unique features. That's really how I started getting sort of writing on evolution and history. Was to, I was trying to understand European monogamy and the status of women in Europe because it was so different from the rest of the world. And uh, so I wrote several articles on monogamy early on. Um, and and you know, it's really an amazing, a big difference with, between Europe and the rest of the world. But we're throwing all that away and bringing all these people in. They don't have any any respect for those kinds of institutions. And pretty soon, I mean, you already see uh, you already see polygamy in, in England and other cases, places where there is where there, where, the, where these where the Muslim religion is. Uh, it's a becoming legal in, in, in the West. This is something completely foreign to our culture, and and it's something that will degrade the status of women inevitably. Yeah, it's it's an observation. I, I think in the West as well, and by contrast, um, which a lot of feminists are also against in some cases, is, is the sexualization of uh, Western society as well. I think it was Aldous Huxley that mentioned, um, as political and economic freedom diminishes, sexual freedom tends to correspondingly to increase, and the dictator will do well to encourage that freedom. It will help to reconcile his subjects to the servitude, which is their fate. Pretty telling, uh, you know, quote there from Aldous Huxley. Is that where we're heading as well? Uh, do you think, Kevin? That's an interesting point. I hadn't thought about some of that, but um, there's no question that the the, the culture has been incredibly sexualized since I was a child. Um, and so, uh, if you look at the media, the movies, and television, things that are just routine now would not have never been tolerated back in the 1950s. In America in the 1950s, you had strong religious control over the media. They had these organizations that would rate films and so on. They were very religiously oriented, and they they just you know censored these things. Uh, but then you know, you know beginning they, this is part of the Cultural Revolution, and then with roots in psychoanalysis, where where any repression of sexuality was viewed as bad and and uh, would produce neurosis and all that. So they, they, all psychoanalysis was again one of these fictitious. Uh, theories that was uh, foisted on on the West and it had all this uh, attention in the elite media and academic world and so on promoted. Uh, it was one of these Jewish intellectual movements I talked about in the culture of critique. Well, that was the sort of intellectual roots of the sexualization of culture, and it's had huge, very dramatically bad effects on the family. Um, huge um, percentages now of children are raised in single-family homes. It's correlated strongly with poverty, lack of academic achievement, and so on. It's very difficult, uh, and and so that's just another aspect of the decline of our, our culture. You mentioned psychoanalysis, and I think you brought up elsewhere. I heard you talk about that the Oedipus complex, obviously Sigmund Freud, this very idea that young boys really want to have sex with their mothers, and young girls want to have sex with their fathers. Where where does that come from, and and how has why have society accepted that as the, a, a truism? It's, it's just one of uh, figment of Freud's imagination. I mean, he just uh, came upon that. And uh, he, he had no concept of, of love, you know, which is a huge part of, of marriage in the West. In the West, since the Middle Ages, and going back really to hunter-gatherer societies, love has been the basis of marriage because it's individual choice. An aspect of individualism is marriage partners wanting to get married because they see personal attractiveness in, in the other person. That's not the case in the rest of the world. Basically, women are bought and sold, concubines and so on. When you have, if 
you look in China, you know, where the emperor would have thousands of concubines, those kinds of emotions are suppressed if they exist at all. The basis of marriage is much more about uh, simply exploitation, you know, it's about sex. And uh, if, if you look at traditional Jewish society, love had no place in it. And, and so uh, that, that was one of the things that John Murray Cudahy, a very important sociologist at Hunter College, uh, wrote about in his book, uh, on, on, on basically on the Jewish uh, intellectual movements, really rejecting Western culture. And they couldn't understand why, you know, you see, you see love and affection being so important for marriage in the West. And so their interpretation was that it was just repressed sexuality. And Freud came up with this edible thing, you know, that boys want to sleep with their mothers, girls want to sleep with their fathers. It was just absurd. But again, the absurdity didn't matter when you had a huge number of, of um, psychologists, the elite media, and so on, on board with it. It didn't matter that there was no theoretical basis for it. It was promoted uh, by a consensus, and, and that's how it's done. It's, it's consensus that doesn't, where the truth doesn't matter. Same with race differences now in IQ or anything else. It's just a consensus point of view that uh, it is not rooted in, in the science, but it's something that if you, if you take issue with that, you will be ostracized. You will be said to be a racist and so on. Yeah. So that's how it works now. Now, I want to just carry on a little bit from some of Freud's work. Then we had um, this kind of carried on under Edward Bernays, Freud's cousin, I think it was. Uh, he was considered the father, or he might be nephew, actually, uh, Freud's nephew. And he's considered to be the father of public relations. And uh, obviously he wrote Propaganda back in 1928 that started to kind of work on this very large manipulative kind of level where you took in, you know, crowd psychology and other psychoanalytical ideas into it, which uh, obviously caused a lot of ruckus and, and, and different things going on. But that back, that's back in 1928. How far back do you think? I mean, obviously, as you said, this is a group, you know, you know, evolutionary thing, so it goes way, way back into history. But if we look at it from the point of view of this being talked about in, in, in education and in media and when this is beginning to uh, be enforced on that level or discussed, how, how far back would you draw it then? Well, you know, it goes back a long ways. Even in the 1920s, uh, with the rise of uh, Franz Boas and the Boasian anthropology, uh, that became sort of the academic establishment. It, was, it became ensconced in, in the lead media. So that even by 1930, uh, people didn't want to talk about race much anymore. In the early 1920s, it was pretty common, but they they started to really clamp down on that. And, and uh so uh, people who had been associated with that, like Lothrop Stoddard and Madison Grant, they were pushed aside. And um, they, this new uh, anthropology that there were no uh, biological differences between races, all cultures are equal, all that kind of thing became the sort of common knowledge, uh, so-called so knowledge. That, that, that became the belief. And it's just a matter of promotion. I think these Jewish intellectual movements understood that. And really, uh, in, in uh, my book, The Culture of Critique, I talk about that as being a basic feature of Jewish society. That Jewish religious ideology was never anything more than a consensus. It wasn't like they looked out in the world and, and, and tried to verify their beliefs about God and all that, the Talmud and all that. This was just their own uh, ideas. And they became established because you had a consensus among elite scholars within the Jewish community. Well, that's really what happened with the Jewish intellectual movements. Western science was always empirically oriented to see what, what, what the world was like. Jewish movements were always about consensus within, within an elite. And, and so psychoanalysis was like that. It didn't, you know, psychoanalysis, they never did any empirical research. They didn't care. They actually scorned empirical research. But it was a matter of just having a consensus within the psychoanalytic society. Uh, the followers of Freud were just uh, absolute automata, where they, they just accepted it, these, these dogmas as true, just like any religion would. And if you disagree with the Oedipal complex, well, they just didn't talk to you. They, they threw you out. You couldn't possibly have a career as a psychoanalyst. Uh, if you said, well, there was no evidence for this or something like that, well, they just wouldn't talk to you. You're out. In the meantime, they controlled these these presses. They they had strong representations in psych, psychiatric departments and medical schools, um, and and it was maintained for a very long time. 
it wasn't until the rise of biological psychiatry that the psychoanalysis basically got kicked out. But uh, until then, psychoanalysis was a very, very powerful movement in American psychiatry. And uh, it had no empirical basis, but it didn't matter. It was about consensus within this elite group. So authoritarians who are listening right now are potentially furious at this point over the fact that you're you know, expressing your opinion and uh, get the opportunity to discuss here uh, the research that you've done. How, how far do you think that your detractors are willing to go to let's say, shut you up in the future. I mean, this is an ongoing battle for you, of course, but it's interesting to me that I think that the very groups in the beginning that had to trump the freedom of speech card, uh, you know, 60s and earlier, to get to discuss many of their ideas that they wanted to talk about, would, I think, really quickly turn on the other, fl the flip side of this and turn towards, as I said, authoritarianism, shut down that level of freedom of speech. Uh, where will this potentially go in the future? I mean, are we going to be locked up for our beliefs, a, a tremendous... Uh, authoritarian system then that prides itself on, on tolerance, but then it will, it will turn into uh, the monster that they claim to have been fighting all this time, if you see what I'm getting at, Kevin. Well, I, I do see what you're getting at. And in America, we have the First Amendment. So theoretically, we, we can say what we want. Uh, in America, there are a lot of informal things. If you work for a company, they, they will get you fired and so on. So even with the First Amendment, we have that problem. <clears throat> but right now in the Supreme Court, there are at least four, there are four justices who are very much opposed to the First Amendment. And, and all it takes is one more. It's hanging by a thread right now. And so there could very easily be laws against uh, thought crimes, hate speech, and so on, so-called hate speech. That is part, and you, you already see that in a lot of European countries, um, where certain uh, thoughts are viewed as criminal, and they can lock you up. And so that that is uh, certainly the wave of the future. And as you say, it's extremely hypocritical, because when the left was on the defensive back in the 1950s, we had McCarthyism and uh, professors are being forced to sign loyalty oaths to, that they were not communists and so on. Now, you know, now, now that the left is in power, they, they do not believe in free speech. Now, there have been all kinds of attempts to get me fired, uh, and, and they've been very successful. The, the, only, the only reason they couldn't fire me is because we had the principle of tenure. We had the idea of free speech. And so if, if they did fire me, there would be a huge lawsuit, and I'd win it because there's just all these precedents. You can't do that. Um, but in the future, that may change. Where do you see politics going? We have, you know, if we talk it from the perspective of America for a little bit, we have the, the, the warmongering neocons on one end that's doing the bidding of, of APAC and, ex, you know, expanding the, the, the conflicts in the world, of course, involvement in Ukraine right here. We have a lot of... Uh, a powerful lobby on that alone. We have, uh, you know, Victoria, fuck the EU, Newland involved and <laughs> all of these people. And then they're, they're seeking to expand that into, you know, Iran and, and, and Syria. Uh, very powerful on that way. And then on the other end, we have, of course, the, uh, the, the Democrats, which is also very interestingly, uh, seems to be very okay with this kind of war tactics as well. They seem to be controlled on that particular regard on both ends. But where will this go politically, do you think, in the future? And how far could... Could this go if we look at the conflict in uh, in Ukraine with Russia on one side? And could we see, will this bloom into another another major conflict? What, what do you think, Kevin? <laughs> uh, there, there are several points there. Um, in America, the Democratic Party is less warlike and, and less under the control of neocons. The neocons do have their feet in both parties. And it's interesting when the APAC, the American Israel Public Affairs uh, Committee, had their conference recently last week uh, in Washington, the whole emphasis was on bipartisanship. They, they, they have lost some support in the Democratic Party. They, the Obama administration is not as compliant with this pro-Israel, this neocon agenda as the, Demo, uh, as the Republicans have been. The Republicans are very much uh, taken with this. Uh, but the Democratic Party is really, the, the, not only are they in power now, but they stand to be in power for a very, very long time because of the demographic change where all these non-whites are voting Democrat and so on. <clears throat> and they're, they're less involved, uh, less prone to this war thing. But the, these neocons do, and, and the APAC, uh, the Israel lobby, do want to have this to be a bipartisan movement. So big pressure now to get the Democrats on board with this. And, and historically, they have been very strong in the Democratic Party. So they're not as like they're powerless. But uh, they, they want to have a, a, a really a, a sort of a consensus support for these policies in both parties. They don't want to have it be just part of the Republican Party. As far as the Ukraine goes, <clears throat> very 
clear that, that, that these neoconservatives are spearheading the movement against Russia and America. Um, it, it, it's very clear in the media. They're, they're, it's amazing to see the propaganda now in, in, the, in the mainstream American media oh, yeah. against Russia. Yep. Putin is seen as a thug. They, they often compare him to Hitler. And this is in the LA Times. This is the New York Times. Uh, Hillary Clinton t compared uh, Clinton to uh, c compared uh, Putin to Hitler. So it's it's just a, a huge movement. <clears throat> and yes, there's going to be conflict. I think there is a conflict now. Uh, Russia um, is in is is in the Crimea, and I think they're going to stay there. I don't think that they're going to give up on that. Uh, this government in the Ukraine uh, is not really legitimate. They're not elected, uh, but uh, they're acting as if they are legitimate. <clears throat> and I think I think Russia has very strong interests in eastern Ukraine, uh, and and they may take that militarily. And I don't think the West can do anything about it, but they will complain and they will isolate Russia, try to do what they can. But Europe Europe is dependent right now on Russian natural gas. I see. Some people, these these talking heads, talking about well, America has to has to ramp up its its uh, liquefied natural gas industry because we have a huge amount of natural gas here. We should you know ship it to Europe so they're not so dependent on the Russians and just really go go to the wall against Russia uh, on sanctions and so on. Well, we'll see what happens, but you know you have to understand Russia's point of view here. They you know ethnically Eastern Ukraine. Crimea has been a part of Russia for 200 years until it was administratively transferred to Ukraine in a move that didn't mean anything in 1954. So there, there's strong historical, cultural, ethnic reasons for, for this. Uh, I'm horrified by what's happening. And I, you know, yeah. when I grew up, I thought of America as the good guys. I, you really can't see America as the good guys now. You have to see what's going on in, in the Ukraine as, a, as, as, as an attempt to get the Ukraine into the EU, uh, and, and if they do go into the EU, EU they will be destroyed. Um, you know, they, they, EU is all about opposition to any kind of national identity, and uh, huge financial, uh, you know, interests at stake here. But so, uh, I think you posted that, by the way, not to interrupt here, but the uh, the uh, Arseny. Yatsenuk Foundation that that website disappeared and if we looked at some of the sponsors there that was really interesting I don't know if you recall that post or not but sh you know obviously Chatham House we had NATO the Department of State even one Swedish bank Sveabank was in there as well to support this and 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 that this is basically leading down the the road of uh, exploiting Ukraine on on multiple different levels economically as well of course but this shows you know w which kind of forces are, are pulling apart Ukraine at this point between Russia and and the EU and I I hope that they go their own way. I hope that they stay sovereign and independent and 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 a nation. You know what I mean? I would love to see that. You know I, I think there's that the Ukrainian nationalists are in the government, but I'm afraid they're going to be pushed aside. Uh, this the, the president that whose name you I can't pronounce anymore. <laughs> anymore. <laughs> uh, this guy definitely wants to to bring Ukraine into the European Union into that orbit. Uh, one of the other uh, um, organizations mentioned there on that webpage was the National Endowment for Democracy, which yeah. is a youth, which is a neocon front group in America. These people, it's a, it's, it's you know the president is a Jewish neocon, um, and and they're all for this globalization, and they're all for war against anybody who stands up against it. So the, yeah, these people have been they, these people have been destabilizing Ukraine since 1991. Exactly. I mean, let me just interject that here. I'm glad you brought that up. I've, I've done that every time I think Ukraine has come up so far. Uh, we don't. We can go further back than the Orange Revolution, but just look at that. Most recently, we had really powerful ex-Zionist oligarchs trying to take control of Ukraine. We had Alexander Goldfarb together with Boris Berezovsky, who's dead now. Uh, he poured over forty million dollars into you know concerts and orange balloons there in the Kiev Square, uh, doing the bidding of George Soros. Um, and the Open Society Foundation to be able to destabilize these satellite states to old Russia to turn them back into the hands, I, th I believe, of these oligarchs because there's a long-standing uh, fight there uh, between this and, and, I mean, since Putin booted these out, I think that that's the main incentive now for they want to try to regain control of Russia again and that's the reason why they're being so immensely uh, demonized in Western media. What do you think about that? 
Absolutely right. The, the expulsion, the sort of downgrading of the oligarchs, they haven't completely destroyed them by any means, but they have downgraded, especially the, the, the uh, Michael Kordakovsky case. Right. He just got released recently, but he spent quite a few years in prison. They took away the, the, the uh, Yukos oil company, which was just incredibly valuable. Yep. Uh, but the same thing happened in the Ukraine. Um, most of the oligarchs, at least half of the oligarchs, are Jewish. And they, they want this, uh, this unification with the West. They want to. In all those moves are going to. They're going to end up destroying Ukrainian nationals, and I, and I hope those Ukrainian nationals realize that forces they may be dupes of these very larger forces that that are totally anti-national, uh, nationalists, and want this integration with the EU, which is the death of all nationalisms. Uh, so if they do that, it's going to be a disaster. What do you think about the? glaring contradictions as well then between the Svoboda party and then working together with uh, some Jewish leadership as well in that direction that this is you know we've we hear from multiple sides of the media that it's basically neo-nazis and then it's you no know, you know it's just a, a national party and no they're working together with uh, some of the Jewish people in there I think Christopher Bolin uh, wrote an article on this pointing this glaring contradiction out there so what's what's really going on there is this a, an effort to let's say De, not de, well demonize Ukraine in the sense that this is going to be the reason or incentive why a foreign power, be that NATO or the US or the EU or what have you, to come in and basically regain and take control over Ukraine because we obviously can't let it get out of hand in this manner, right? Is that what they're trying to do or is something else going on here? Well, I think what the, 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 some of the Russian rhetoric has, has been misleading. You know, they, they want to emphasize the quote, quote neo-Nazis, fascists and so on. Though there are, you know, the the, the, the Svoboda Party has, is a nationalist party, and they have a, a sort of history of anti-Jewish uh, sentiment and so on. But uh, again, they are only part of this government, and I think the the, the main government, certainly what the United States and the, the EU want, is they want Ukraine in the EU, and and they're going to suppress these nationalists when they get a chance. Uh, so it's very inaccurate to say that, uh, that these nationalists are in charge. They're not in charge at all. They have, they have three government ministries, I think, and it is possible that they, they could uh, take over. But they're not there yet. And, and uh, these forces against them, certainly the current government, the president and so on, these people are very much opposed to, to, to nationalism in general. So uh, we'll see what happens. But, uh, you know, I, I would hope they would go their own way. I, I, you know, become a nationalist state, make a you know friendly alliance with Russia, but not dominated by Russia. That that's fine, but uh, they have to be terrified of of the current government of of, of Ukraine. Yeah, it's uh, it's very interesting. I wonder what they will do as well. I mean, if we look at that, the 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 much uh, praised model of of democracy. Let's say that they use this very model, has been happening in some of the other European countries now where some of these more nationalist parties have gotten power because of that democratic model. This is just a portion of the of the uh, the, the electorate in the country. They, they, they vote this way. And and there's been a glaring then uh, opposition almost to the democratic process that, okay, we, we didn't think it would go in this direction because we can't obviously have these these kinds of people in charge, right? We, we that's, that's just not going to happen. So it seems like they're almost willing to, to, uh, to uh, scrap the democratic model because they know that they need to be in charge when it comes to, you know, putting people in place that they can uh, control and do the bidding of the new world order in, pl in place, right? That's right. I mean, I, the, the, the EU doesn't really believe in democracy. In fact, I forget the details, but one of the uh, the big treaties was not ratified by everybody, so they just just sort of enacted it administratively. Um, and and uh, so they don't really believe in democracy. Uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. And, and because uh, you know there are movements now, as you say, and I'm very optimistic that these movements are going to have an effect. But you know, say if you if the uh, if the U UKIP wins in in England, or uh, if the National Front wins in France, or one of these other nationalist parties wins, you can expect a huge blowback from the Euro European Union. They're they're going to try to uh, ostracize. Recently, they, they they had that vote in Switzerland very narrowly rejecting the, the idea of free movement of peoples and yeah, so on. And that's right. They have to put quotas on immigration. Well, the EU is outraged at that. Yeah. And they, they, uh, so they're thinking of all these ways they can put sanctions on Switzerland. Well, that, that's what they're going to do. They're going to, they don't believe in democracy. They believe in, in the, these principles of free movement of peoples and massive immigration and the 
destruction of all national identities. That's what they believe. Yeah, you're right. And uh, Nigel Farage, by the way, from UKIP there as well, he uh, saw a recent uh, speech you know, by him. And, and I mean, by far, uh, he, he speaks about issues that, that people are uh, you know, passionate about. And it's, it's, I think there is a reason why they're winning. And it's just the basic idea that he's even talking about some subjects that all the other parties just refuse to touch. And I think that they don't even understand that, that again, people are, it doesn't matter what kind of your personal opinions about this is. It's just a very basic idea that he's talking about something which has been uh, taboo, uh, you know, marked taboo in the media, and therefore more, more and more people will just be drawn to it because of the fact that he dares to speak about these issues. Even that alone, I think, is winning him, and uh, you keep a lot of uh, uh, votes, actually. I hope so. And, I, you know, it, it reinforces what we've been saying, that, that, that fundamentally the EU does not believe in democracy and does not believe in freedom of speech. Uh, it, it's uh, it's a very scary, you know. It's it's sort of a version of Marxism, really. They 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 want a sort of uh, very strong top-down control, and they're constantly expanding that. Well, exactly. We have this uh, uh, old USSR vis- whistleblower as well speaking out about uh, the European Union turning into the new uh, Soviet Union. Actually, I'm, I I linked that up, uh, yeah. linked that video up for you guys. You you can check that out. It's very very interesting in itself, but. A uh, couple of points here before we begin to round up then, and uh, one is, I think Yanukovych, by the way, the uh, well, he's not the old president, he is the president, he's a- a- existing in Ukraine now. He's insisting right. on TV that he's actually still in charge of Ukraine, and that this acting government that's in place is illegitimate. And it's just amazing how this shift can occur in this way, and that it, I think we saw the same thing in Libya, basically, where spokespeople for the government there, when the uh, forces toppled over that legitimate government, they're just saying, you know, this is this. Is, it's rebel groups that are coming in and just taking over here, and it's uh, by no means uh, this is acceptable. But in this case, of course, the the Western world, NATO, the EU, and the US are are, are just along for the ride, and this, this, it's no problem to detopple legitimate governments like this. But it would what would they do if it happened in one of their own countries and and a movement <laughs> arose that just t- toppled over the government? I mean, my God, the whole NATO would exactly. be in there soon. Yeah. If you had if you had protesters in Washington D.C. that were anti-government, they would round those guys up. They would shoot them. They'd do anything. Yeah, that's right. And and it's, it's so hypocritical. Yeah. This this new government in Ukraine is saying it's illegitimate for to, for to have a plebiscite in 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 Crimea, where they're going to ha- actually have a referendum on whether they should stay with with the Ukraine. And they're saying that's absolutely illegitimate and illegal. Well, they're they're taking power was not legitimate or legal. I mean, it's just it's just incredible the hypocrisy, and the, and the Western media just just floats right over that. <laughs> Usually, you know, democracy is, is so such a hugely good thing, but somehow this government was so horrible, but they couldn't wait for an election to get rid of it. It's just amazing. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is amazing. Um, so we'll see what happens here then in terms of Russia. There, just a last note on that. Uh, it, it seems when we're looking at some of the media outlets and whatnot that the shift has really uh, taken place now where Russia, to a certain extent, represents some kind of conservative force almost in the world. And the West her, had, had turned into a culture representative of Marxism, really. It's a complete reversal of the situation, isn't it? It is. And it, 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 certainly uh, one of the things that Putin has done that is, you know, he's, cra- he's uh, you know, upheld sort of traditional values related to homosexuality as opposed to gay marriage. This whole pussy riot thing, uh, you, you know, they, they were like saints in, in the American media. These people go into a church, they desecrate a church, they do all this stuff. And, you know, what would happen if they, if they went to a synagogue in New York City and did that? They would, they would you know, they would lock them up. But the pussy riot were viewed as, as some kind of cultural saints by the Wall Street Journal and New York Times and all that. Uh, it's, it's incredible to see it. But, yeah, Russia is is a sort of cultural conservative and and they're endlessly um vilified because of their stance on homosexuality homosexuality is like the god of all rights right now in america indeed now what strategy should uh white stand in your view currently take on a on a group evolutionary uh tactic to to figure that out <laughs> well we we have to organize them and, and that's what we, you mentioned the american freedom party I am involved in the American Freedom Party. We're we're trying to to you know emulate these groups in Europe, like the National Front uh, um, in, in France, uh, the, the um, UKIP in in England. There's a Swedish party, right? The Swedish Democratic Party, right? Is, is yeah, Democrats, that's is that right. right. 
And the same thing there, by the way, they're, they're just in, insanely uh, vilified in the mainstream media, yet they're just using the democratic process. <laughs> it's like the That's right. people vote yeah. for them. I mean, so be it then. You know, again, it's like it's not about if you agree or not. It's the fact that they've been set up this idea of democracy. This is the system and this is how it works. And now some people are voting for him. But that all of a sudden now is completely unacceptable and it's just not going to happen kind of thing, you know? That's right. But I, I do think that ultimately, uh, actually, most of these parties are not talking about white racial identity. They're simply saying that immigration is a disaster, that multiculturalism is not working out, yep. and they're getting a lot of support. Um, ultimately, I would hope that, that we would be able to say, yes, we're white people. We have interests like everybody else. We are an identifiable racial ethnic group, and, and we should be able to have organized politically to, to, you know, to further our interests in, in our, our people and our culture, uh, like every other group does. And, and so that, that ultimately we have to do that. And so part of what I'm trying to do is make this legitimate, to make it something that people are not ashamed of, that people are not horrified, that they don't think that they're morally evil to assert themselves as a white person who has white interests. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, you know, Jews uh, stand up as Jews and have Jewish interests. Uh, black Africans stand up and have, you know, interests uh, as black Africans and black Americans and so on. White people are the only people on the face of the earth that uh, for, for whom that is considered morally unacceptable. Yeah, well, exactly. And uh, I mean, again, I've, I've always been for diversity, meaning the multitude of, of, of different people and cultures and everything else. And multiculturalism has just turned this into a a gray goo, pretty much. It's just a, a sludge where nothing kind of uh, <laughs> comes out of it, which is very sad, of course, because there, it is the eradication of those, you know, wonderful differences that exist there. So in this process, then, last point here, in this process to uh, legitimize this, uh, as you say, then, Kevin, is there a, a disassociation that needs to occur here as well with certain white supremacist groups, etc., neo-Nazi groups, or how, how do you view that question? Well, I do. I think there has to be some disassociation. Uh, so often in the past, uh, they, these, there have been groups, uh, skinheads in America, and their motorcycle gangs. Uh, they're relatively uneducated. They're prone to violence, dealing drugs, and they might have this Nazi ideology. Now, um, in America, a lot of those people, the, those groups are all infiltrated. You don't know if there's anybody that really believes this. I think sometimes they're just used by the media and, and paid by the different informants and so on, I, I, but whatever it is, we, we have to dissociate ourselves from it. Uh, we, we can't be involved with uh, violence. Uh, you know, so much of the, uh, the reason why white identity is vilified is that the picture that the media has successfully portrayed is that anybody who thinks that whites have, should identify as whites, that whites have interests as whites, these people are uneducated and they're violent, they're evil. And uh, they're stupid. Uh, if you look at any number of American movies over the last 40, 50 years, anybody uh, like that is uh, portrayed as stupid and violent and evil. And so that's the image that we have to overcome, that we're not stupid and that we're good people. We have good families. We, you know, uh, are morally uh, acceptable. We're, we're good people. And so that, that big part of our image is to, is to, you know, and again, it goes back to what I keep saying, that Western Europeans, we tend to form these moral in-groups based on reputation, going back to our hunter-gatherer uh, times. So moral acceptability is a critical feature. We have to believe that we are morally right. And you can't get any white people to go along with these kinds of movements unless they think that what we are doing is moral. So that, that's the critical thing, is to establish our moral credibility. And what we are doing is morally credible. If we don't act in, in, in terms of our own interests, we are going to be obliterated in the long run. Our culture is going to be uh, disappear. We're going to be dispossessed. We have a moral obligation to our, our descendants, to our, to our ancestors, to, to, to do this. We have to, we have to identify. We have to uh, fight for what's, what's, what's legitimately ours. All right. Well, thank you for your time today, Kevin. Very uh, interesting. And uh, this is, of course, going to be challenging to the Frankfurt School educated majority. That uh, includes those in the alternative media as well, I'd say. The truthers out there who believe that they are, you know, awake and uh, smart to the agenda, but actually are doing the bidding of those who invented critical theory 
And do urge everyone to just look at the Frankfurt School, get smart to their agenda and realize what really is going on there and realize that this is a long, long, long plan. And it's part equally as much of any other components that we've looked at when it comes to the new world order and everything else. So get smart to it and uh, realize what's going on. Research, look at history. That's really important as well. So again, uh, then uh, Kevin, tell us about your website to give out all the details. And of course, tell us if there's anything else we have uh, upcoming on the uh, schedule that you'd like to mention. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Um, my, my main website, I two, three, actually three websites, the axon observer.net. Uh, is a is a website with a lot of blogs, short articles, long longer articles in some cases, um, <clears throat> and it's about you know current events. We have things on the Ukraine now and so on, um, <clears throat> and I, I I post myself there, but we have quite a few other people as well involved. Um, the other uh, website is the Occidental Quarterly, which is more of an academic journal, um, and we have longer articles, uh, academic you know a lot of footnotes and so on. Um, and that is at, at the accidentalquarterly.com. You can get print subscriptions or electronic subscriptions, not, not very expensive, like $30 US for an electronic subscription. And uh, finally, I have my own website, kevinmcdonald.net, which has a sort of stores all my articles and, and um, has links to the Accidental Observer and so on. So I'm continuing to write. Um, I'm working less now in my academic job. Uh, I'm retiring. and. Uh, I'm, I'm working to further these ideas. To, we have to. Everybody's got to say to themselves, "What can we do to advance this stuff and and get on page and 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 move it ahead?" Thanks again, Kevin. Thank you. Well, there you go. That's our two-hour segments with uh, Kevin McDonald edited together into uh, one longer segment. We do that with our programs now and then, so that you can uh, listen and learn. And uh, enjoy our productions and conversations. Uh, we do not have any commercial interruptions. And all of this is uh, featured on an ad-free website from where you can stream or download over a year of uh, programs for free. So if you do enjoy what we do here and if you want to hear our second hours, catch the full broadcast and all our shows going back to 2006, please uh, sign up at redicemembers.com. Our archives are full of interesting, engaging and controversial topics. Have a look around. I'm sure you can find something that will uh, spark your interest. It's really just a wide range of topics that directs, uh, you know, what subjects we cover. Some we want to examine to see if they hold water. Others we want to learn more about and uh, as a means to do investigation, basically. And you can listen along in that process of inquiry. And uh, we hope that you can learn from that as well. Other programs are things that we are more firmly attached to and interested in. But by no means is our program designed to be conformist in any capacity. We uh, walk our own way. This is our own radio program and our productions truly independent in that capacity. All right, we have uh, more programs coming up here, of course, in uh, just a few days. Dane Wigington is coming up to uh, discuss geoengineering and the artificial climate change. Later, we're going to talk about the strange murder case of the Swedish Annie Burjesson, who died in Scotland almost eight years ago now. And uh, we'll speak with her mother, who has been leading the investigation of this case herself, and also with Tom Minogue over in Scotland, who has been lobbying the parliament there to open up this case, since there have been put strange legal restrictions on what material can be accessed. Upcoming after that, we have uh, Stephen McNallan on Asa Tru and Norse mythology. We also have Sophia Smallstorm, Mark Weber and uh, Judith Very Baker, to name a few. Have a great rest of your day, and I urge you to think and to question, and we will talk to you more soon. RedEyesCreations.com and RedEyesMembers.com. Have a good one.